It's incredibly rare when a band is able to redirect the world's attention towards a neglected facet of music. In the 60s, it was rock and roll. With the 70s, it was hip hop. And the 90s had Guy Manuel de Holme Cristo and Tomas Benghalteo's EDM creation Daft Punk. If you were to take it back to 1990s Paris, you would see an entirely different set of artists. It's where this duo had their first rock band called Darlin, releasing several songs under Stereo Lab's duophonic record label. They captured that early 90s garage band style under an insignificant company attempting to challenge the status quo. Send this all out. Send this all out. Send this all out. It was pretty shit. Which is exactly what Melody Maker Magazine thought too, going as far as saying that their sound was daft, punky trash. So the duo rebranded themselves towards the untapped market of dance music under the name Daft Punk. And after several solo releases, they debuted their first album, Homework, in 1997. And people loved it. Daft Punk was given the opportunity to start changing the connotations towards the capabilities of alternative music genres, especially when they brought in the horizon of musical possibilities across the planet. An example would be their 1997 classic, Around the World, where the song repeats only those three words 144 times in seven minutes. Yet it placed in the top 100 in several countries, oceans apart for weeks on end a lot of which had to do with how they conducted their music videos to complement the experience of the song. The video was designed to be geometrically and numerically satisfying by emphasizing the repetition of the dance movements and the beats of the time signature. It was the dichotomy between pre-established familiarity and Daft Punk's retro illusion that made their musical presence unique. When Daft Punk released their second album, Discovery, in 2001, it had an appealing blend of house, disco, funk, and soft rock that made it an immediate sensation, which opened the opportunity to start establishing greater illusions towards their musical presence with the use of their signature robotic helmets. The concept of using masks was always a Daft Punk staple, but the robotic helmet originated when Tomas's sampler caught on fire while the two of them were working on demos. They joked about it saying, fixing the sampler turned them into robots. The implementation of the joke constructed the image we know today, but Daft Punk lives off their illusion considering that they haven't had an official picture of their face taken since 1998, baffling a lot of fans because it wasn't necessarily new to change an artist's look, it was the commitment to the helmets that made Daft Punk and their album stand out. But what carried a lot of the album's success was their film Interstellar 5555, One more time. manifesting a unique story about funky aliens being captured by the government and forced to play under human disguises. It's so incredibly foreign, it's hard to imagine that this has anything to do with two French guys and robotic helmets fusing dead genres into a revived hour-long music video. It's fucking weird. But it's the ethereal way Daft Punk challenged the status quo of the music industry that makes it compelling. They took the concept of stylized imagery and exaggerated it until it broke. On the behalf of, uh, on the behalf of the robots, <laughs> Just like to say, first of all, man, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it was this type of new perspective that attracted Joseph Kaninsky to hire Daft Punk to score Tron Legacy because they aren't disc jockeys. They're incredibly talented and intelligent musicians that have distanced themselves from traditional cold, stale techno to provide a means of giving their new fusion the warmth of other genres of music. And if you were to immerse yourself into their score, you could almost hear the thought process. My personal favorite in the soundtrack would be Solar Sailor. It begins with the definitive Daft Punk synthesized eighth notes, laying the groundwork for the subtle orchestral arrangement to catch wind and cooperate in a foreign environment. The electronic arpeggios sync with the swells of a full-size orchestra. It's the attention to detail that makes the score so easy to listen to. And I feel like this level of dedication is lost in most scores, resulting in a muddy mess of music, which is why Tron Legacy stands out in the musical world. In 
2013, Daft Punk released their most recent album, Random Access Memories, which harnessed the aspect of disco in its entirety, and their image had now been relinquished of their notoriety as a techno band, giving Daft Punk the opportunity to win four Grammys respectively, two of which came from their hit song Get Lucky, finally allowing the limelight to shift to a different approach to music. Unlike other artists, their use of autotune isn't out of necessity, it's a stylistic choice. Daft Punk operates with a different process. While most artists develop the catchy chorus and work backwards, Daft Punk evolves individual layers throughout the song, resulting in a cohesive chorus. You can hear every step in creating their songs. And it doesn't need to be said how subjective art forms can be, especially in regards to music. There are never right or wrong answers, just ones that are more popular. Often, the history of an artist is more important than the work they produce. Daft Punk's evolution from their French garage punk roots to the trendy robotic techno fusion duo that they've become today is a large part of their identity. Their progression through different genres led them to challenge the standard approach to making music and to override the top 40. Thank you.